think I did. Sorry about that. Well, morning, church. I hope some of y'all have already started having a little bit of church in here. Um, man, I'm excited to preach to you this morning on Memorial Day weekend. Um, what a great honor to be able to be here. Amen. I'm going to say that one more time. What a great honor to be able to be here. There are people all around our globe today that don't have the same freedoms that we have because of the lives that were sacrificed for them. And we have people who have sacrificed everything they have. Jesus said the greatest thing a man can do is to lay down his life for his friends. And there's been some people who have laid their lives down for me and you so that we could be here today and worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You know, no matter what you might think and no matter how you might feel, I want you to know we still live in the greatest country on earth. Uh, we have such an awesome privilege to be here and doing God's work, which is why this is such a fitting time to start this series called Be the Switch. Um, but before I get into my message, I almost forgot, this is why I put notes down. For those of you that don't know, I have extreme ADD and I forget everything. Um, I just want to share with you, we had a, what I would call a victory at our uh, Paris Council meeting uh, last Wednesday night. Um, we did not get a vote for moving the Paris Council meetings from a Wednesday to a Thursday, but I believe that we've opened up the eyes of those that we need, and I believe this is going to happen. Um, right now, it looks like they're going to vote on this on June 12th. Um, but we will let you know, right? We, you never know if they're going to actually be able to put it on the uh, agenda or not. So if we, once we get the word that it is on the agenda, we will let everyone know. Uh, we will meet up here again. Uh, I'm actually going to crank up the 15 passenger bu- uh, van. If anybody wants to ride with me, can ride with me. Uh, and then we'll make sure you're back on time for service. If we're a little late, don't worry. Just get involved in worship and start going crazy. Because uh, hopefully we'll be celebrating uh, what God is doing. Amen. Uh, but thank you for all those who've been uh, reaching out. And you know what? If you, uh, if you can and you're willing, call, call your representative and let them know that the church wants to be heard. Amen? Brother Mark can tell you exactly who your, uh, who your um, representative is for your district. Amen. Well, let's get started on this new series. Every day, people live their lives... And they feel like they don't really have a purpose. Have you ever ran across someone like that before? Or maybe that has been the picture of your life. And then one day you go to church and you hear some preacher say, in Christ you can find everything you're called to do. Have you ever heard that message before? Isn't it a great message? It even makes you feel excited to go do something for Jesus until you walk out the door and and most Christians will leave out of a church service and say, but what am I supposed to do? <laughs> Have you ever had that thought go through your head as a Christ follower, as a Jesus follower? How can God use me? If you've ever asked that question, I hope that we get to answer that for you. As believers in Christ, we all have a calling. Every single person in this room, you are called to do something for God. It's not just about us on a platform. It's about every member doing what God has called them to do. Um, Maybe you're not called to join the mission field. I'm there with you. This is my mission field. (laughs) I've been out in the mission field. I, 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 I like to share this. The coolest thing I ever saw in the mission field was going into a little church in the hilltops of of Mexico and getting into the where the Indians live in Mexico in the Chiapas area. And I went to church service, and I sat on the wrong side of the room, and a little old lady came, pinched my ear harder than I ever felt in my entire life. And she's like, and I'm looking at the people, I'm like, what? You're sitting on the wrong side. I said, oh, I didn't know. So I had to move over to the other side. Um, But what was really cool about this experience, not that part, that was just kind of took me off guard. But what was cool about the experience was I'm looking at the platform in that little church in the mountains, and I saw tortillas. I saw corn. I saw coffee beans. I saw all kind of cool stuff on the platform. I'm like, oh, I wonder what the object lesson is going to be. And I reach over and I look at the pastor of the church. I'm like, what you using the corn and stuff for? And he's like, that's offering. I was like, what? 
And he said, that's offering. I'm like, wait, that's, they brought this for offering? He said, yeah. He said, you see that pile of tortillas? And he pointed to a little lady in the church. He says, she gave up her entire meal today to make sure she gave to the church. Y'all, my jaw dropped. And I saw corns of, uh, ears of corn. I saw coffee beans and all these things that were valuable to them. And my world was changed after that. But I want you to know I still didn't feel called to go live there. <laughs> my life was changed, but I didn't have this earning after I walked out of there like, Jesus, I need to be in Mexico. In fact, right after that, Brother Larry Myers throws a bucket of concrete on my shoulder and says, carry it up on that roof. And as I'm carrying up the roof, I can't wait to get home. <laughs> But we're not all called to the missions field. We're not all called for full-time ministry. But we all have a relevant and important part to play in this thing called Christianity. Amen. And we're called to impact lives right where we're at right now. So here's my sermon thought for you this morning. We're called to be the switch that illuminates the world around us. I have the awesome privilege of my grandfather was an electrician. My dad was an electrician. I gave it my best effort. Um, <laughs> but um, my grandpa had a rule. You know, I, I worked for a company where we had to use lockout tagouts. Anyone ever else has to do that type of stuff? My grandpa didn't understand lockout tagout. Um, my grandpa's philosophy was, hey, is that off? Sure is. Okay. Pow! <laughs> it wasn't off. He said, I bet you'll check it next time. That was his definition of lockout checkout. Um, I checked it out all right. It was locked out now. My hand's locked up. But um, So I, I would help out and try to do my best, you know. And I can remember trying to wire light switches. And every once in a while, I'd wire them just not just right. And the off would be on, and the on would be off. And, and, or I would flip it on like that, why well, this doesn't work, and I could hear a little spark in the background. Bzz, bzz, he's like, I, what did you do? And he's still taking it apart. Right? So even to this day, I still like, Dad, I got this electrical thing at the house. Uh, come pat your eyes on it before I touch this and don't hurt myself. Um, and so being a switch requires us to understand how the switch is supposed to function. The switch all by itself doesn't really have much to do. You can play with it like as a fidget toy or something, but that's all it does. You can just go up and down, up and down, up and down. But unless you understand how to apply its function, a switch is just a switch. And for most of us, our lives are like a switch that we haven't applied its function to our current everyday life. And so we have this switch called a life, and we're walking around trying to figure out what it's supposed to do. Have you ever found that switch before? The switch to nothing? Yeah. <laughs> Every once in a while when we take the teenagers on, on trips back in the day, I'd always find a light switch. And I'm the type of person that when I walk into a room for the first time, um, I act like I own the place. So I'm that guy, by the way. And so I walked in the rooms before, and I started hitting light switches. I'm trying to get surrounded, understand stuff. I'm like, all right, yeah, these switches do this. This switch does that. This does that. And every once in a while, I find that switch. Hey, Jesse, go over there. See if it does something. <laughs> you know? Jesse, hold that. See if it shocks you or something. You know? But every once in a while, we find that switch that's on a wall that looks like it has a purpose, but it doesn't do anything. And I find a lot of us in our lives, we have gotten into a place where we are comfortable on the wall. But we're not plugged into anything. And if you find yourself either the loose switch, just trying to find where you're supposed to be, that's good. That's awesome. Figure out where you're going to be and God will use you. But I feel in my heart today, I'm speaking to a lot more people that you're in the wall, and you know where you're supposed to be, but you haven't been hooked up to anything. So here's what I have to ask you this morning. I have two questions to figure out what your calling is as a switch. Number one, what breaks your heart? What breaks your heart? Is it one of those animal commercials that come on TV? They get me too, don't feel bad. And I don't even like cats. When the cats ones come on, I'm like... 
Those poor cats. And I don't like cats. But what breaks your heart? What really breaks your heart? What is it that you see in this world and you think, man, somebody should do something about that? That's probably God speaking to you to do something. What about this one? What things have you been through that you can utilize to be the switch? Have you ever been through some stuff in your life that you realize, hey, you know what? You come across someone else's path, and their story sounds a lot like yours. And you remember just how difficult that story was in your life. And maybe that's the switch that God's called you to use. I think God uses that one in me a lot. I can tell you things that break my heart. Um, there are certain things that really break my heart for our community. When I wake up on a Sunday morning and go to Walmart, and Walmart's got more people than all of our churches combined, it breaks my heart. Not because Walmart's open. Thank God Walmart's open. It's Memorial Weekend. People got to get stuff. But what breaks my heart is that there's more people doing stuff right now that are sitting in the churches in our entire community. In case you haven't realized, there's over 30,000 people that live in St. Mary Parish. There's not 30,000 people in church. That breaks my heart. And I'm not saying that I want them all here. And God wants to bless them. That's awesome. But there's, there's where everybody's welcome in every place to fit to their position. That's what breaks my heart is our community. I think that's why God has called me to be a pastor, because community breaks my heart. I see the mission stuff, that breaks my heart too, but it doesn't break my heart the same way as our local community does. So if you want to know what breaks mine, that's what breaks my heart. Second thing is, how can I use my experiences to be the switch? You know, I have a, a very unique uh, testimony. Preacher's kid, born dead. I uh, understand pressures of people looking at you, expecting one thing, and not being able to uplift those, those pressures. Having a child out of wedlock and having to have that look down upon you over, over the years. Being a guy who's not educated, didn't graduate. I, I was sharing this with my kids this the other day. I never got to walk down the aisle for an eighth grade graduation. Don't know what that feels like to get a diploma. I didn't get to walk down the aisle at my high school and get a, a, a diploma. I don't know what that feels like. But you know what? God has blessed me. Amen. And God has promoted me in a company that I'm in a position I should not belong to. So guess what? I get to look at guys who got college degrees and say, slow down, buck. Let me give you some life experience. I'm glad you got that piece of paper. And all the other papers like, oh, you're that guy. I'm that guy. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I want that paper for my kids, though. <laughs> but listen, listen. So I can take the things from my life that I've gone through and see other people dealing with stuff and say, how I walked through that, I've been there, I've dealt with that situation. I have struggled just like you have struggled. I'm not some perfect guy that walks around with, a, with the perfect outfit on all the time and looks perfect all the time and my kids walk in a straight line. Man, my kids walk all over the place. I love when people used to try to come tell me about my kids. I'm like, I know. <laughs> you ain't telling me something about my kids I don't know. Everybody tells on preacher's kids. <laughs> you just looking to judge me. But we all have things in our lives that either breaks our hearts or experiences that, have you, that we can use to reach people. So we're going to look at a couple different passages of Scripture this morning to understand how God wants to use us to be the switch. First one we want to look at is in Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. I'm sorry. I am very parched this morning. Acts chapter 9, verse 3. And before we do that, I want to set this up real quick. I've used this scripture a lot, so I'm not going to go real deep into detail. But the Apostle Paul has been killing Christians for about three years at this point. Um, again, if you read your Bible for just the face value, you might read this and think he's been killing people for two weeks. No, it's been three years that the Apostle Paul had been killing Christians by this time. Uh, it was about one year after the resurrection that Paul started his mission. Of killing Christians. And this is when we get to verse 3. As he was approaching Damascus on this mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. 
He fell to the, the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what to do. Saul picked himself up off the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he was blind. So his companions led him by the hand to Damascus. Now I didn't include this in, in the reading, but there's something that always stands out to me in this passage. Is that when Paul gets shown this bright light, his companions see all this going on, but they're standing off in the distance. And Paul starts going through this amazing situation where Jesus shows up and flips the switch. Amen. And Paul goes blind. <laughs> that's a bright light. But the people that's with Paul can hear a voice, but it's just Paul. And you're like, you need to deal with that, brother. I don't know what's going on in your life, but you can deal with that and let us know when it's over. And then they're like, oh, it's over. Okay, come on, let's take you someplace, right? And so they take him into Damascus. And Paul starts a journey that he's never going to forget. There's another guy in this same story by the name of Ananias. And in my opinion, Ananias is one of the bravest guys in the Bible. Ananias has to face down Saul, the Christian killer. All right? A lot of times we look at David when he faced off against Goliath and like, man, David was so brave to go up against God. Y'all, Goliath was dumb, half blind, and stupid. David had the advantage the whole time. <laughs> Ananias had to go up against a blind Paul who was surrounded by companions. That's not an easy task. But God told Ananias to go talk to this guy named Saul and reach out to him. This is what it says in verse 15. But the Lord said, go for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to the kings, as well to the people of Israel. And I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Thank you, Jesus. Is it that tough? No? Just me? All right, I'll keep reading. Verse 17. So Ananias went and found Saul. He laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, stop there. Brother Saul, this would have been the, uh, the Philadelphia brother, right? Brotherly love. He'd have walked up to him and said, Man, I know that you were on a mission to kill me and to shut down what we were working on. But my brother, I love you. And God said for me to lay hands on you. And it changed Saul's life forever. I believe this with everything in me. It wasn't getting knocked off the horse that did it. Because a lot of us have been knocked off of our horses before. And not used our getting knocked off the horse to go where we were supposed to go. Because we forgot to find a brother who was going to pray with us. Saul could have just got knocked off the horse and got stuck in his pity party of being blind. But God sent somebody his way by the name of Ananias. And Ananias reverses the switch. Verse 18 says, instantly something like scales fell off Saul's eyes. And he regained his sight and then got up and was baptized. First thing I need you to understand about being a switch is it's not about your past. It's not your past that you need to be worried about. Your past is not your excuse, church. Your past is the fuel God wants to use to do something. Your past should never be your excuse. Your past should be the fuel God wants to use to do something. I am so thankful for everything I've been through. You know, we live this life out and we say this statement. I don't know if we really mean it, though. No regrets. Have you ever used that statement before? I got no regrets. <laughs> you got a couple, huh? I'll say this. Every experience I don't regret having, but some of them I wish wouldn't happen. And I think Saul 
who later gets called Paul, felt the same way. I don't think that he loved his past. I don't think he walked around being like, yeah, it was good times killing everybody, man. I enjoyed the heck out of that. that was, I'm so glad that happened. That wasn't his identity, but yet he stayed stuck in identity. We talked about that last week. That identity was always popping back up. But Paul received the call from God, and it changed everything for him. He had a messed up past. Anybody else got a messed up past? Had a messed up past, but God still chose him to change the world during his lifetime. And God has a way of doing that, doesn't he? God has a way of making our past or taking our past and leveraging it for his glory. So it's not about your past as your excuse. It's about your past as your fuel. I hope that helps somebody. Don't let your past define you for being a failure. Let your past define you for helping someone else crawl out the pit. I can't tell you how many people I have had the opportunity to use my messed up past for. And it's bad. I don't want y'all to think that I went to seminary and, and everything was perfect and great. I didn't even go to seminary. I, I did the whole, whole old school hard knocks. Just read the Bible and read sermon notes. God's just taken this little messed up dude and used all of his old problems and mistakes to be a switch for someone else to come alongside and call him brother. You know, one of the things I love, one of Brother Lee's sayings, he would always say, you know, you can't be on the platform until you're willing to clean the toilets. Um, amen. <laughs> he made me clean a lot of toilets. Um, but I, was, I had the awesome privilege the other day. We, uh, one of the young guys who was in our youth ministry, he's a youth pastor now, and went to dinner, and I started asking him, like, man, what's... What's the biggest thing you notice about youth ministry or being involved in ministry now? He says, man, he said, it's so hard to get people to do stuff. And I'm like, I know, man, that's the toughest part, right? He said, volunteers are tough. You know, it's hard to, you know, in, in motivate people, get people involved. He said, yeah, it's just so, he's like, I'll get somebody excited for a little while and then they're gone and I got to get, you know, work and all this stuff. I'm like, I said, man, <laughs> so you remember when we used to do stuff and you would want to preach? And I'd be like, yeah, well, we got to go clean the youth room. And y'all wouldn't really like to clean the youth room. Or y'all wouldn't want to come help set up for camp. But you wanted to preach. And I started seeing this, this guy, and he's like, all of a sudden the light bulb had gone off because now he's in a different position. He's like, he said, yeah, man, I'm so thankful that you made us do these things before you let us do these things. Because, see, when we understand the work that we had to go through to get through our past, we can really enjoy our present. And so sometimes it's not about looking at our past as the bad. Sometimes it's looking at our past and joy of present. I'm going to look at another guy. This guy is by the name of John the Baptist. Anyone heard of him? John chapter 1, verse 19. It's going to be on the screen so you don't have to flip your Bibles around if you don't want to. John chapter 1, verse 19 says this. This was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders sent priests and temple assistants from Jerusalem to ask John, Who are you? He came right out and said, I'm not the Messiah. <laughs> what a great statement, huh? First of all, I need y'all to understand why this was even happening. John had charisma for days. He was so charismatic. He had so many people following him, and he wore borlap saps and ate locusts and still had thousands of people out there. Y'all, you don't get people... Come and hang out with you eating locusts and wearing burlap saps unless you got something going on. Because this brother would have been itching while he was preaching to you. He's like, yeah, so uh, repent. You know, he would have been doing some crazy. You ever put on those little jumping sack things? They itch. They're aggravating, right? Paul, I mean, John is out there, and he's, he, he, he was a little off, a little crazy. I think it happened at birth, right? Remember Jesus showed up with, with, with his mama, and he was in his mama's belly, and he started doing backflip. He was crazy before he was born, right? So, so John, had, he had a lot of charisma, a lot of things going for him. People just were drawn to him, even though he was a little crazy. And so they're like, dude, you got to go find out what this dude's about because he's a little off-putting. 
but he's also very brash. He's vocal. He's not scared to go up against the Romans. This might be our dog. This might be the one. This might be the one. He, he's just crazy enough to get us out of this mess. So they show up and they're like, hey, hey John, who are you, man? It's like, whoa, time out. I ain't the Messiah. <laughs> not me. No, I'm, I'm crazy. He's coming, though. Not me. I'm not the Messiah, right? What else does it say? Well, then who are you, they ask. Are you Elijah? He's like, whoa, 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 whoa slow. You bro, ain't Elijah either. That brother ain't dead. <laughs> It says, he replied, are you the prophet? Uh, no, he replied, are you the prophet we are expecting? No. Then who are you? We need an answer for those who sent us. What do you have to say about yourself? And John replied in words of the prophet Isaiah, I am a voice shouting in the wilderness, clear the way for the Lord's coming. The second thing you have to understand about being the switch that God's called you to be, it's not about you. It's not about you. Everybody needs some uh, ego poppers in their life. That's what I like to call them. The ones who walk up beside you and deflate your head a little bit. I had those in my life. I told you all the time, I always like to pick on Jesse, but he is my ego deflator. He is the only one. If you ever see him walk up to me and he's pulling my ear, it's because he knows my heart better than almost anybody besides probably my wife and my parents. And he will walk up to me and he'll just do like this to my ear. And I'm like, stop. I'm not, I'm not trying to be like that, you know. But he's always trying to make sure I'm where I'm supposed to be. When John had this understanding of, look, don't call me a prophet. Don't call me anything. I'm just a voice. You know, when I read that, it jumped out on the pages at me. And I said, God, I just want to be a voice. I don't want Word of Life to be about Marky. I don't want my ministry to be about Marky. I just want to be a voice. You know, I, I used to always joke, and, and, I, and I actually, I mean this, by the way. I have an issue with people that like to put their name on everything. Is it really about you? Or is it about what God wants to do? You know, I've had people in the past ask me to come preach for them. I'm like, hey, I need your picture. I need this. I need that. And I'm like, I don't have a, I don't have a profile picture and stuff like that. Like, I don't, just, just put on our guest speaker. That way, if I'm good, they'll remember my name. If I'm bad, they won't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's not about you, though. John fit the mold of this powerful person. He fit the mold of this person that could lead people and give them the encouragement they needed. And they came to him seeking for him to pull them from something that he could not do. The reason why it can't be about you is because you can't do what God can do. And when people are looking for you to pull them out of their pit, you will drop them every single time. So to be the switch, you got to understand it's not about what you're doing. It's just about the voice that's speaking through you. John knew he was called. And he knew he wasn't Jesus. He was just a tool to point to Jesus. And every single person in this room, you're a tool to point to Jesus. So it's not about you. So who's it about? Let's look at it. We're going to go to Exodus now, chapter 1. And this is going to lead into next week too. Exodus chapter 1, verse 15. But before I read it, I want to set it up for you. The Hebrew people by this time began to outnumber the Egyptians by leaps and bounds. Joseph had came on the scene and had blessed the Egyptians, and Joseph was the guy who was over everything. You remember Joseph, the coat of many colors guy? Well, Joseph had been dead for a while now, and the, the Egyptians had forgotten about how the God of the Hebrews came in and saved the Egyptians, and they were back focused on the pharaohs again. And this new pharaoh shows up on the scene, and they do a census of the people. And he realizes that the Hebrews are outnumbering them. And he's like, whoa, hold on. We got to do something about this. So the Egyptians made the Hebrews their slaves, thinking, well, if we oppress them, we'll be able to control them, and their numbers will start to level out. But that didn't, that wasn't the case, because God was still blessing the Hebrews. Verse 15 says this, 
Then Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, gave this order to the Hebrew midwives, Shiphrah and Puah. When you help the Hebrew women as they give birth, birth, watch as they deliver. If the baby is a boy, kill him. If it's a girl, let her live. But because the midwives feared God, they refused to obey the king's order, and they allowed the boys to live too. And if you continue reading, and the Hebrews kept spreading like rabbits. That's the Mark you translated. Verse 20. So God was good to the midwives, and the Israelites continued to multiply, growing more and more powerful. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people, throw every newborn boy into the Nile River, but you may let the girls live. If it's not about you, then who's it about? It's about God. It's about God. Now, when I say it's about God, and I read the passage I just read, you will question, how is it about God? Or is it just me? God is blessing these people, yet they're still being persecuted. God is with these people, yet they're still killing their babies. God is walking with his chosen people, but yet they are slaves. And it's all about God. Let me show you how. Verse 2. I mean, chapter 2, verse 1. About this time, a man and woman from the tribe of Levi got married. The woman became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She saw that he was a special boy. Not special and that special. He was special in God's sight special. Saw that he was a special boy. And kept him hidden for three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she got a basket made of uh, papyrus reeds and waterproofed it with tar and pitch. She put the baby in the basket and laid it among the reeds along the banks of the Nile River. And I'm not going to continue to read the story. I'm going to share it with you. And as they put this little baby in this basket and this baby starts going down the Nile River, this baby just happens to come across the Pharaoh's daughter. Just happens. And just happened to come across the right Pharaoh's daughter. Because this Pharaoh's daughter is like, oh, the baby! Oh! It freaks out. Falls in love with it. Falls in love with it so much, he's like, oh, I don't know what to do with it. Gives it back to his mama and says, would you raise it until we can have him in the palace? And this mom gets to raise her little boy and has to give that little boy up again. The little boy is by the name of Moses. And Moses grows up in a palace. Because even though our lives look like a mess sometimes, and even though things are not how we want them to be, it's still all about God. Because God took a little boy that was doomed for death, puts him in a palace. And we're going to learn a little bit more about that next week. Moses was rescued at birth for a purpose. Even though he later would run at, uh, after committing murder, he killed somebody. God still found him. And Moses would ask this question, how can I do it? But all we know is that God would do it through him. Because God empowers his people. So maybe you sit in here today and you think, how can I be the switch? Number one, use your past as your fuel. Even your good past, by the way. I, 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 always, I always tend to like to talk about the bad past and how people grow up really rough. Man, if you've had an awesome, blessed life, share that with people. People need to know that life can be good. It's not about you, and it's all about God. It doesn't matter who you are, where you've been, or what you've done. God can still use you to fulfill his purpose and plans on this earth. You know, one of God's greatest things that we can keep ourselves reminded of, God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. None of us are qualified to do what God wants us to do. He qualifies us as we're obedient. So as you're taking steps to be the switch, 
realize that you have a calling in your life. God has placed an anointing in your life. He's placed a calling in your life. And the day that you accepted Jesus and you said, I'm going to be a Christ follower, God placed something inside of you that breaks your heart. And you've gone through the right experiences in life to use those to help somebody out. There's a reason why your heart aches for what it aches for. And there's a reason why you've been through what you've been through. It's because God wants to use you to be his voice. To be that switch. To light up the world. I love what Jesus said. Your eyes are the lamp that is beaming with light. Has you, have you been being the light of God? Have you been the light of Jesus? Or have you been the light switch that has no purpose? That's a, that's a hard challenge. I understand. That's not like lovey-dovey stuff right there. But has your light had a purpose? Or have you just been sitting on the wall comfortable where you're at and not doing anything? Might be time to take the face plate back off, check the wiring a little bit, and make sure you're connected to what you're supposed to be connected to. Because God wants you to be used right where you're at. So even if you don't like where you're at, you still have a purpose in that place. I don't think the Hebrews like being in Egypt, being slaves. But God still had a purpose. And like I said, we're going to talk about that next week. Amen. So as we close out this morning, I want to make sure everyone in here that you are saved, that you know that Jesus is Lord and that he died on the cross for you. It's the most important decision you get to make in your lifetime is to say, Jesus, be my Savior. It doesn't require a whole lot from us. I think sometimes we make this a little too complicated, if I'm being honest. Jesus was on the cross and had two sinners sitting right next to him. One sinner said, don't forget me. And he says, you'll never be forgotten. It doesn't get easier than that. We make it more complicated than it needs to be. I need you to know that it's, he's as close as the mentioning of his name. And all he's requiring of you is to serve him, to hear from his voice, and to do what he wants you to do. And that's to be the switch for him in this world. So we're all going to say this prayer together. And if you say this prayer for the first time, or maybe you're rededicating your life today, there's a, little, there's a little cord in the seats that says, I made a decision. Would you just fill that out and drop it off for us? We don't want to pressure you. We don't want to bother you. We just want to pray for you. Just like Ananias did with Saul, he says, I, my brother, I'm here to pray for you. With my brother and sister, we're just here to pray for you. And we believe God's going to do something great for you. So let's say this together. Jesus, thank you for taking my sin and putting it on the cross. Today, I give you my life for the sacrifice you made. And I will follow you with everything I have all the days of my life. Help me be the switch you call me to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, stand to your feet. I want to bless you this morning. Ooh, it's been a good day in church today. I can, I, man. I might just make them play some worship music, and I might just stay in here for the next 30 minutes. I don't know. Father, I just thank you for every person that's here today. God, I know sometimes in our lives, the things that we've gone through in our past are a struggle. But God, I pray today we use it as our fuel. God, when you begin to promote us, I pray that we don't lose sight that it's not about us, but it's all about you. Because, God, even in difficult situations, we can see that you are still in it. And it's all about you, God. Everything I go through, my highs, my lows, God, it doesn't matter where I'm at in my journey, it's about you. And so, God, I pray that you will help me to continue to be the switch. And, God, you will continue to help every person under the sound of my voice right now be the switch that you called them to be, no matter where they're at, Lord that they will turn their lives on and people will see you. 
So Jesus, as we are in our community and we are lighting our community for you, I pray that you have your way in our lives, that you bless us. Lord, you give us testimony after testimony of your goodness and what you're doing. Father, we go through blessings, not so that we are blessed, but so that we can be a testimony. So God, I thank you for your blessings that you're pouring on your people so that we can be a testimony for you about your goodness and all the things you're doing in our lives. Lord, for those of us that are struggling right now, I pray that you make a way and you give us the peace that we need. I don't know who that's for, but I just sense in my spirit right now there's some people that you're just, you're battling right now. God just wants you to know he hears your voice. He hears you. Say that one more time, he hears you. And he's going to make a way for you this week. Father, I thank you for what you're doing right now. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen.